There we go. It worked. Guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. It is wonderful to talk to all of you. Excuse the background. I'm in an Airbnb right now in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Just got finished filming uh, for the day. So here I am. Welcome to chat, everybody. Thank you for coming in here. Today, we're going to be talking about why do avoidant men cheat in relationships. I would love to hear from you guys over in chat. Give me your, well, maybe not wildest, not, not the wildest, but what do you guys think? Why do avoidant people tend to tend to cheat? Not always, but uh, why do avoidant people, do you think, tend to cheat in relationships? What are their reasons for it? And I don't want to ask that in such a way that makes it sound like every avoidant person cheats because they don't. But chat, what's your guess? What happened? I don't know. I got stuck in a perpetual loading screen over here on this end, but here I am now. So welcome, welcome. Um, cheating in relationships. Did you guys know the research? It's really fascinating on this. We can't figure out how many marriages experience infidelity. It could be as few as 20%, and it could be as high as 71%, right? The numbers are actually all over the place. Some of the best educated guesses that we have um, seem to seem to indicate that about two-thirds of marriages may experience some kind of cheating. Now, that includes physical, full physical like intercourse kind of experiences. It could be micro cheating. It could be uh, emotional affair. It could be kissing, right? It, it kind of depends what people consider cheating, but they say up to 60, somewhere around two thirds of marriages alone will experience some sort of, some sort of an infidelity behavior. Does that make sense? How long is this live? I want to sleep, but I have to see it. You know what? Uh, probably about 45 minutes is what we're going to aim for today. I'm going to cut out about five to 10 minutes before the hour. So we'll be all right. If you really need to sleep, that's okay. Keep in mind, this is recorded. Uh, actually, thousands of you watch these live recordings for some reason later on, and I'm glad that you do. So thank you so much. I say for some reason. I know it's because we we talk about a lot of really crucial stuff in here. Um so uh, the vast majority, it seems like, of relationships will experience some sort of infidelity experience at some point, again, defined differently by people. So it's kind of subjective, but uh, the biggest indicator often, especially of, of affairs in the first couple of years of a relationship, and this is anecdotal as well from, from the work that I've done also, is avoidantly, avoidantly attached people do tend to cheat more often than people of other attachment persuasions, if you will. People who are more avoidant do tend in that direction. And there's some very specific reasons for that. And it is not that they are bad people. It is not that they are incapable of being honest. It is not that all avoidant people cheat. None of that is true, okay? All of it, all of it, it comes down to some very key specific features. I know because I've worked with a tremendous number of men who are avoidantly attached and some women uh, who have cheated and they come to me to stop cheating. And they come to me sometimes after the relationship has ended and they say, I don't ever want to cheat again. I don't like who I was and I want to fix it forever. Some of them rush into my coaching and say, you know, this is my last attempt to fix my relationship. My wife said that if I don't get it fixed right now, she's leaving me. So here I am. Right. I get a lot of those. Um, Usually I have the wife come in <laughs> during the first session so that we can really get everybody's opinion and then build the plan going forward. Um, but it happens, you guys. It does happen that a lot of avoidantly attached people often do cheat. Now, there's very specific reasons for that. I would love, love to hear why you guys think that is over in chat. I see a couple of answers. Distance. Sometimes distance can be a factor. Sometimes it can be. Um, needs a backup. That, that. Okay, interesting. Um, YouTube, I'm going to sit it out with you. Are we allowed to ask questions about personal situations? You know, at the end of this chat, uh, at the end of this stream, I do turn on members-only chat, and members can ask me those questions. I also, if you're looking for a place to really hit me with questions like that, I have my mentorship group, the Attachment Circle, for asking more personal questions, especially in the, in the, the Q&A calls and the coaching calls that we do inside there. Hawk, there you are. Lack of emotional connection. Starved for connection. We're getting closer here. We're getting closer. I like these. I like these. Um, you guys are not terribly far off. So there's a couple of key factors that leads avoidantly attached people to cheat. And especially at about one to two years. One to two years. Um, dopamine. There you go, Sahara. You're getting much closer. You've, been, you've, you've heard this one before. I like this. Um, avoidantly attached people 
are very much on the dopamine and cortisol pathways. They don't usually bond properly through the oxytocin bonding pathways because they didn't usually get it as kids. They don't have that experience. So even me saying that doesn't make much sense to them. I'm like, what the hell is this guy talking about? What is the oxytocin bonding pathways for my avoidantly attached people out there who are watching this right now? Hello, welcome. Um, the dopamine cortisol pathway is I'm going to be stressed out, stressed out, stressed out, stressed out, high performance, and then I will cope with dopamine. Now, unfortunately, once they get into relationships, that doesn't really change. And they try to connect with other people by giving dopamine to other people. Unfortunately, this often comes across as, as giving oxytocin to the other person, especially to an anxiously attached person. This is what we call love bombing. I will give you incredibly good feelings. And in return, you'll give me good feelings. And that's really what an avoidant person understands in relationships. They don't understand what they're accidentally often provoking in the other person is oxytocin, that bonding hormone. They don't realize that they're creating an addictive cycle in the other person. They just feel like it's dopamine. Now, dopamine is fantastic for a while, but the novelty of it starts to wear off and you have to escalate it or shift into a new focus for it. The novelty of a new partner doesn't last that long, you guys, maybe five to seven months. This is why at five to seven months, most avoidantly attached people start to say things like, you know, I'm just not feeling this. I'm not sure this is right for me. Maybe monogamy isn't my thing. Maybe there's something wrong with me. You know, it's not you, it's me. You know, I don't know why I'm not connecting. It's just not feeling right. You know, you have a lot of emotions. You know, why are we, why are we going so fast? Maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should back off. And they start really questioning everything because the novelty dopamine is wearing off and they're not feeling good anymore. And often at this point, the other person senses it and starts pushing a little bit further and pushing a little bit further and pushing further and wanting more and more. Naturally, wanting a relationship because the other person's bonding with oxytocin and, and they're trying to get deeper into the connection. And I apologize for my hair. I was out in a very windy area while I was out there. So apologies again for that. I'm just noticing that. Um, that dopamine bond it lasts for a short time. And then the avoidant person tries to justify staying in the relationship as their enjoyment and pleasure diminishes further and further and their exhaustion starts to climb. Now, usually at about mm, 10 months, 12 months, maybe 14, but 10 to 12, they'll start trying to search for a dopamine hit. And usually this means getting back on Tinder early and just looking, getting on Instagram, just looking, following people, maybe even messaging people, but it's dopamine hits. So when they get caught, they say, this means nothing to me. That person means nothing to me. And they're right. That person means nothing to them. Not like a sociopath, but that person was just a dopamine fix. Uh, I had a coaching client come in not too long ago with his wife and say, you know, I'm, and, 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 you know, Adam, I want to fix this, this porn addiction I have. And she said, well, it's not just that. She said, I've seen his search history. He goes on Facebook and he clicks on those links for like find local singles in your area. And then he searches and, and goes through there. And the thing is, usually they're not trying to cheat. Most avoidantly attached people are not trying to at all. They're trying to get a dopamine hit, but it starts to escalate because they need more dopamine each time. They need bigger and bigger hits. Great. Thanks from Russia. You're the best. Hey, thank you. I appreciate you. Welcome in here from Russia. <laughs> um, yeah, that dopamine hit, you guys. That's all that they know. And again, it's not that avoidantly attached people are bad people. They only know dopamine. This is why when they do wrong and they micro cheat or fully cheat, they usually just come back and try to give you flowers, chocolates, candies, compliments, kindness. They buckle down for a while. They try to give you good feelings. They're trying to restore the good feelings to you because they just feel like good feelings were lost. Now they owe you. They're going to pay you good feelings for a while. But when your feelings are continuously hurt, then they say, how long is this going to go on? This is unreasonable. I didn't hurt you this much because all I did was take away your dopamine for a while. The reason that most, uh, not most, the reason that avoidant attachment people commit infidelity, the reason that most of those affairs happen is what I'm trying to say, is because they don't have much of a framework for the relationship factor and how much it hurts to be cheated on. Most of them don't know how much it hurts to be cheated on. Most of them don't have the bonding process and the biochemistry in their brain to not cheat. And that's not to say that they're just going to randomly cheat, but the pieces that are there that would stop them, the, the stress relief that's there that would kick in, the serotonin that would kick in and give them joy and pleasure and relief, that's not there.
The bonding processes that would help them understand how much it hurts is not really there. So it's not that every avoidant person is a mindless machine who's going to cheat, but it is much easier for them to fall into that trap and that thinking, that temporary temptation kind of thinking justified by the dopamine binges. It is much easier for that to happen. Okay. And then they truly do feel bad about it. They do. The vast majority of them truly feel bad about it. So they buckle down. They promise they will never be happy again. And this is why many of them sometimes will cheat a second time because they promise they will buckle down and never be happy again as penance for what they did wrong. And all that's going to do is cycle them back into misery and the relationship will break up eventually anyway. And they say, well, wow, I did all that suffering and all that penance for that person for no purpose at all. And it just never got better. And this really just makes them more avoidant. It really just wounds them deeper. Gustavo, welcome back here. Hi, Adam in a different place today. Yeah, this is an Airbnb. As I've been traveling, filming for my podcast, the I Wish You New Podcast, is what we're doing. Hi from Australia. You guys are all over the place. You guys are all over the place in a good kind of way, in a good kind of way. How do we fix this problem? So how do you stop an avoidantly attached person from cheating? Or if you are an avoidantly attached person, how do you stop yourself from cheating? Because many avoidantly attached people, they're horrified by this. They don't like it. It's, it's not who they want to be, but they are on an endless dopamine quest. They are always questing for dopamine. When they get stressed out, they look for dopamine. When they are miserable, dopamine is all they really understand. They don't want it necessarily, but it's the only thing that helps them feel better. Most avoidantly attached people cheat because they are stressed, not connected, and have never experienced the brain chemistry that would help them not cheat and lead them to like really not ever cheat. And I don't mean like, yeah, not that they'll always just automatically cheat, but long term on like 50 years of a relationship, if you are stressed and miserable and unable to connect and have no hope that you'll ever feel better, eventually <laughs> when you're starving, rotten food starts to look good. That's really ultimately why avoidantly attached people cheat is because rotten food looks good when you're starving. That's the best way that I can really phrase that to you guys. So how do you fix this? Well, it is to not be starving. Some of you guys talked earlier about emotional starvation, and that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. How can you truly love if you have an avoidant attachment style? Do you need to change? You do. You need to change. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to become emotionally soggy and crying and open and naked in front of everybody. What this means is that you need to learn the proper biochemistry of bonding. You have to learn how to get off the cortisol and dopamine pathways and actually properly receive serotonin so that you don't chase dopamine binges when you're stressed. You don't chase you know, pornography. You don't chase, you know, finding someone to hook up with. You don't just get on the dating app just to feel good for a moment and get validation. A lot of avoidantly attached people, that's how it starts, right? They start by chasing the little dopamine, but then it slides in that direction more and more. It goes really, really far in that direction. My ex was addicted, cheated repeatedly, later diagnosed with Parkinson's, not treated with dopamine. Um, you know, I, there, there's many people always ask me about ADHD. I saw that earlier. People talk about Parkinson's. People talk about sex addiction. Um, when your brain is not getting the proper biochemistry, it can look like a lot of things. If you are on an endless junky quest for dopamine, it can look like a lot of things. You can get diagnosed with a lot of things. You may even have diagnoses. Now, can we say that these diagnoses, some of them may in fact come from this type of brain chemistry, which is an avoidant attachment style adaptation. It's possible, or at least that they're exacerbated by those things, made much worse by, okay? So what you need to do is build serotonin and oxytocin bonding. That's what an avoidantly attached person needs to do to fully avoid the temptation even to cheat, okay? You need to build the relationships that cultivate oxytocin and serotonin. Now, this comes about by having deeper discussions. I was just talking today uh, with Mark Groves, who is very, very big about taking ownership of your relationships and, and your behaviors in them. He talks a lot about a, a connection piece with people and, and how to connect with them and why that's so important. And um, he, we were talking just today about how if you don't have the hard conversations, you are having them. 
it's present in every conversation you have, every message you send, every message you don't send, everything you don't say. It's the tension in the corners. It's the shadows in the corner of your eye every time you convert, conversate with that person. The hard conversations you're avoiding are always haunting you. And that's the reality of avoidant attachment style. The hard conversations you're avoiding are always haunting you. If you can lean into those challenging conversations, and that's, that's part of this video course I'm building this week, How to Love an Avoidant Man. I'm filming that this coming Saturday in a studio. Is how do you lean into these hard conversations and have the hard talks that will then free you from that dopamine cortisol pathway and allow you proper oxytocin and serotonin bonding? How do you have those events? How do you have those talks? That is crucial. And being able to do those and have those talks and build that trust and build those connections actually removes the avoidant behaviors from you. You may still sometimes have spikes of anxiety or concern, but that doesn't mean you are really avoidantly attached. That means you are more securely attached. You're behaving in a securely attached fashion. You may have some residual anxiety responses, but you will be securely attached with your partner. And this is incredibly important because when you have the oxytocin bonding, you will be loath, loath to ever hurt somebody in that way because you'll understand how it feels. And you'll actually be drawn to them in a way that you're not drawn to anybody else. So you can't swap one sexual partner for another. And in the same way, you won't be chasing dopamine binges because serotonin is so much more fulfilling. You'll be looking for serotonin and oxytocin instead of on that endless dopamine binge. In other words, the dopamine binges lose much of their flavor. So even cheating, people with, with avoidant attachment style, when they come in and, and I work with them in a couple of sessions, they'll say, Adam, even like me with sex, I tried to go back on Tinder and it just, it was not fulfilling. I don't even want to do it anymore. Well, yeah, that's because you have, you know, a diminishing return on dopamine in that, in that area, number one, because you've done it so much. But, but number two, you have found what's truly fulfilling to you. Something that is truly, deeply fulfilling on a whole new level that you haven't experienced before. And you don't really want to go back to the basics like that. When you are hungry for a big, juicy hamburger, you are not looking for a, a pixie stick full of sugar. You want the hamburger. Serotonin and oxytocin would be the hamburger. Dopamine would be the pixie stick. If you've survived your whole life on eating nothing but pixie sticks and vitamins somehow, and that's all that you've survived, and then suddenly you have the biggest, juiciest, most delicious hamburger in the world, you don't really say, yeah, I'll we'll stick to the pixie sticks and vitamins. You want to go forward. And this is, this is really the biggest piece for people with avoidant attachment styles. Once they finally experience that serotonin and oxytocin connection with another human being through loving, fulfilling connection, they don't want to go backwards. This is, this is what drives them forwards into full transparency, into a real transformation. This is what, when, when they have cheated, and this is the program I run them through, for example, married men who come in who have cheated and they don't know how to fix their marriage and their wife is one foot out the door and they come to me and I, I work with them on fixing this. Once they experience the fulfillment of an authentic, transparent, secure bond with that wife, the wife doesn't want to leave and the man wants to become more connected with her, more emotionally intimate. It guides him into doing those things that transform him. And by doing that, it shows her that he is worthy of trust, that he's a whole new person now. It's not only how you stop someone from cheating. It's also how you recover after an affair. It's how you recover your self-respect. If you have had an affair, if you've cheated, you're not a bad person. You're usually just starving for all these brain chemicals and you haven't known much better. That's not to excuse cheating, you guys, but it is at least often the reason the cheating happened. And we can do both at the same time. We can hold someone accountable for their choice but we can also have compassion for that person for not having known really much of the difference. So that is why avoidantly attached people often will cheat, especially in the first couple of years of the relationship, for one year to two years typically, not, sometimes a little later, but usually one to two years. Anxiously attached people, it's a whole other story. They usually cheat a little bit later on, usually out of resentment. Um, that's a whole other story. So it's not just avoidantly attached people who cheat. I've never really seen securely attached people cheat, to be honest with you. That doesn't, I'm not saying it's never happened in the history of humanity, but by and large, the person has an, has an attachment challenge. I will say that people with disorganized style 
uh, from my experience, are the most likely to cheat. Again, not because they're bad people, but because they are they themselves are so chaotic and turbulent on the inside that they are afraid of relationships, afraid of closeness, and they are the most likely to sabotage their relationship. They often will will cheat as a means of driving their partner emotionally out of their life and then be horrified at what they've done and try to rush back in and try to make it better and thereby make it even worse. And, and, and it just becomes horribly chaotic. And, and this is why many people say disorganized or fearful avoidant is, is like the most painful partner to have. Um, again, not because they're bad people and I'm not here to demonize, but they, they are by, by far, from my experience, the most likely to cheat because they're the least in control of their behavior because they're sabotaging in both directions. But the avoidantly attached partner, because there's just so darn many of them, there's like five, anywhere from 10, five to 10 times as many avoidantly attached people as fearful avoidance as disorganized. Uh, two to five percent on disorganized versus twenty-five percent of the population on avoidant. Um, it happens, you guys. It happens. Avoidantly attached people often will cheat. Often. The more manipulative variant is more likely to cheat. The more ethical avoidant people are less likely to cheat. So the more manipulative you are, the more likely that is to happen. Uh, but the more emotionally starved you are, the more likely it is to happen. Uh, the more wounded you have been, the more likely it is to happen. The more you've been cheated on, often the more likely it is to happen. There's a lot of factors that go into this, but again, I'll circle back here. Your brain chemistry, it's not your destiny, but it is a massive co-determining factor in your destiny. So if you want to control your behaviors, if you want to build your great relationship, if you want to protect your relationship, if you want to recover after an affair, make sure that you are working toward that secure attachment, okay? Make sure that you are building that serotonin in your relationships, not just by scraping the bottom of the barrel with uh, SSRIs or, or with exercise or with fitness and, and, and nutrition, but in deep, fulfilling relationships where serotonin is, is often produced. Make sure you're doing that. That's where you're going to get a lot of the bulk of your serotonin. Make sure that you are building your oxytocin bonds with the partner or with, and with the people in your life. If you do that, you won't lose your edge. You're not going to lose your edge, but you will switch from lone wolf survival mode, more likely to cheat, into group thriving mode with some people that you trust, into like tribe tribe of people that you trust where you can bond and nurture each other and enhance each other and help each other grow. Very important that you be able to do this. If you can reach that, then you actually become stronger, more likely to reach your goals. I'm headed to work, but I have updates on our last life. Well, go ahead, Dozer. Would love to hear. Would love to hear. Um, all of this, whether you're avoidantly attached out there or you have an avoidant partner or you've been hurt by an avoidant partner in the past and you wondered why they cheated and you blamed yourself and you felt like you weren't enough, I will say that you weren't enough for their brain chemistry because you couldn't be. Human relationships are based, built on, sustainable ones, built on oxytocin and serotonin and vasopressin. That, that's a whole other topic though. But oxytocin and serotonin is where they're built. And if you are a person who gives oxytocin and serotonin to a person who is entirely dependent on dopamine, which is unsustainable, then either you have to get plastic surgery every five months so that you look new and different and you keep giving them the novelty. You got to dye your hair or you got to wear different lingerie, you know, all the various things that we think about when we talk about spicing up the bedroom, it's a lot of it's dopamine. You can't be enough for them. Nobody can. That's why they come to me and say, Adam, I, I wonder if I'm not built for monogamy. Right? Dopamine pathway is not built for monogamy. Dopamine pathway is built for survival and coping. Not long-term sustainable relationships. You look exhausted. Don't forget self-care. Thank you, Dozer. Um, it's just been a long day of filming. It's been a long day of filming. That's all. And I was out in the sun. I got some really good sunlight. Maybe I'm really mellow. Maybe I'm really mellow from the good sunlight. That might be what it is. But thank you. I appreciate that. Adam sat in the sound for an hour. He's glowing. That's probably a big part of it. I might be a little sleepy from the good warm sunlight. Sunlight, vitamin D gives you good serotonin as well. So 100%. Instagrammer. Hey, Adam, what do you think? T 
taking GABA pentan can affect avoiding some of FA started taking GABA. You know, um, a lot of people ask me stuff like that and, and things that decrease your anxiety will make it easier for you to then do the things that would lead you to have more secure attachment. Think of it that way. I have seen people at times with massive overwhelming levels of anxiety at times under direct physician care uh, use some anxiety management tools that then lower the threshold so that they can then have the conversations they've been afraid of and have been avoiding so that they can then repair their their secure their attachment and become more secure. I have definitely seen that. Hey, Adam, I left for a minute. We're able to answer my question. Do we know what predicts an, uh, no, we, I, I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of people that can spitball what creates a predator in that way, but it's, it's definitely not avoid an attachment. Usually it's a personality disorder is what it often is. Um, that's exactly how I feel. Thank you. It allowed me to have the conversation. You're amazing. Thank you, Instagram. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, that's, there's a variety of ways to lower the threshold for the conversations that are then going to fix the actual problem. Massively important. How do you give oxytocin and serotonin to your partner? Well, you need to know that they can actually receive it. So avoidantly attached people, uh, they they don't have the experience. So so trying to give it to them is very, very difficult. They have to be open to receiving it. Very important that you have that. Ah, these are good questions, you guys. I, I just want to say this. None of this tonight, and the topic title and everything, you know, um, I, I, none of this is to demonize avoidantly attached people. Some of them are wonderful, wonderful people who would never cheat in their life, who are some of the most moral, ethical people in the world, okay? It's just that when you are that emotionally starved and that distant from others, again, Sometimes it can become all too easy to make decisions that you yourself even don't agree with. Instagrammer, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I would never have made the connection without hearing you say GABA all the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, remember that GABA uh, is supposed to come from your oxytocin levels, which are come, supposed to be derived from your healthy relationships. You have healthy relationships with secure attachment. You feel loved. You have low stress in those relationships. You get oxytocin. And then you start releasing GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. As you start releasing GABA, your stress and your cortisol goes down and it maintains a lower cortisol stress relation in the, in the future. Now, as that happens, you can start more oxytocin bonding, which gives you more GABA, which suppresses your cortisol more. So the more you suppress the cortisol, the more loved, the more loved you feel, the more you suppress the cortisol, the more loved you feel, the more you suppress the cortisol, and the more loved you feel, the more you suppress the cortisol, back and forth and back and forth. It's a positive upward spiral. But with avoidantly attached people, it's a downward spiral as they feel more stressed. The, the, the cortisol also blocks the reception of oxytocin, especially early on. So if you don't reach a critical threshold, you can't spiral up. You actually will spiral down because it, it stops the flow of, of oxytocin and then, and then GABA. So you need you do need to reach a certain threshold. Of, this is why most avoidantly attached people, excuse me, they didn't get much oxytocin in childhood, so they've never entered the upward spiral in adulthood. Keep that in mind. That's a big, big, big piece. Our avoidance remorseful when they cheat. Often, yeah. I mean, especially when they see that they've actually hurt you, but their framework for understanding how they have hurt you and how deeply that has been wounded, they don't really have, again, they're not, not empathetic and they're not sociopaths, but, but they themselves haven't usually experienced an oxytocin bond. So they'll know that it feels like somebody lied to them and they'll know it feels bad, but they don't usually understand the absolute personal depth of biochemical rejection and betrayal. And they often don't understand why the other person is freaking out saying, what did I do wrong that you would do this to me? They're like, what? This meant nothing to me. It's nothing that you did. Why are you even asking me that? I don't understand why you're blaming yourself. I did this be, and they'll say, I did, I just did this because I, I just felt like I had to. I just did this because I don't know. I was just looking for a feeling. I, I, it didn't mean that much to me. Like you seem to think it did. Right. And then they'll say those things and they almost don't seem to make sense. But those are honest answers. You guys, the things that people think they're lying about, those are fairly honest answers. OK, now, avoidantly attached people. 
I don't want to make you out yourself or anything, but as you're watching this later or even watching it now, am I right or wrong in that capacity? Let me know. Let me know if I'm right or wrong on that. Can't tell you how much I appreciate your insight. I started watching because I'm an avoidant, but I had no idea how much it would help me as a fearful one. Yeah, no, 100%. Well, Hawk, Andrew, are you going to church? You're volunteering with your community or helping with local ministries? Oh, question. To, okay, I see. Archeon, what kind of attachment style causes people to fall in love really, really fast and get attached really, really fast? Um, disorganized style. Disorganized style. They're chasing the dopamine binge, but they're also chasing the oxytocin high at the same time because they're avoidant and anxious. Uh, and then they start flip-flopping back and forth wildly. Disorganized people, will, uh, fearful avoidant, will, will usually fall in love fastest. Not always, but often will fall in love the fastest. And keep in mind, there's two different types of fearful avoidance, you guys. Um, there's the one who's anxious on the inside and avoidant on the outside, and the one who's uh, avoidant on the inside and anxious on the outside. Anxious on the outside, avoidant on the inside is the most likely to leap both feet and hands and face first into a relationship and then freak out the moment that they are loved and return and backpedal, burn the place down, dive out the window, regret it, kick in the door, come back in, handcuff you, drag you back out the window because the place is burning down, go to another building, set that one on fire. Right. Not, not to demonize, but I mean, that's it, emotionally, it, it is it is a very wild, very chaotic, very dysregulated sort of sort of relating system. That's me. I fall in love super fast, start flip flopping. It's the worst. hundred percent. hundred percent. All right, you guys, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to turn on uh, members only chat. If you guys want to join in and talk and ask questions, pop in, become a member. It's $9.99 a month to join and support the channel right down here. Hit that and you can become a member. Hawk, uh, misunderstood question. Barbie, Princess Barbie, there you are. What do you do and what to do when they sing? They just want to be friends. Back very differently. He's actually conversational, taking about things, being patient. It just hasn't hope. Um, my friend John Delaney has a great, great, great quote. Uh, he says, behavior is a language. Pay attention to what somebody's behavior is saying to you. Words mean very, very little. And women get so wrapped up in words and so wrapped up in what a man is saying that they will actually ignore what he's doing. And they think his behavior is lying when his words are telling the truth. And it's really the opposite. A man's behavior always trumps what he is saying. So Princess Barbie, what are their behavior saying? And even the fact that they are completely opposite in what their behavior is saying and what their words are saying, that itself is a pretty big warning sign. I'll just let you know. Okay, when I was in high school, I'd get super obsessed with one girl. When she rejected me, I'd feel like I was dying. This happened to me a few different times. I don't want to be that guy. No, that's the oxytocin bonding and then the massive withdrawal and then the grief. Um, and then feeling like you being rejected means you yourself are unworthy. You're being set aside as being un unworthy as a human um, versus being a bad fit. We just talked about this in my attachment circle mentorship community just today. That was our topic which was, you know, discerning if someone is a good fit for you versus judging that they are a bad person. These are wildly different things. And understanding that someone can reject you as a partner, but not reject you as a worthy human being. Those, those can be two very, very different things. He's saying nothing but acting amazing. I'm, I might be misunderstanding what you're saying then. They say they just want to be friends, but they're acting different being conversational, taking about things, being patient. Are you saying that they are acting flirtatious towards you, trying to build romance, but claiming they only want to be friends? Is that what you're saying? I, I would be cautious just because their words and their actions are not aligning, and that's usually not the hallmark of a, of a very healthy, securely attached person. That's all. That's what I mean. He's going out of his way to help me using his resources to help me start my business. Ah, yeah, I've seen a lot of avoidantly attached men say, hey, I just want to be friends, but then they wow you by helping women start a business. I've, I've seen that. Oh, I've seen that a lot. Um, specifically, he helped me start a business. I've seen that so many times. Um, often that is an avoidantly attached person, usually, uh, who is doing it that way and is giving you good feelings. And, and they'll say a number of things. And not necessarily liars. It's, it's just... It's just that they themselves don't often understand what they want. Um, they themselves don't often have the right framework to be able to pursue healthy relationships. They often don't have secure attachment. That's what I mean. Again, not that they're bad people and you have to be like aware, or like warned that he's going to like break into your house. Right? I'm not saying that. Just 
just be aware. Be aware that the words and actions are out of alignment. They're opposite of each other. That's all. That's all I mean. Members, what questions do you have for me? I am here to help. I'm here to answer questions. After this, I'm going to go have a discovery call. I don't know if you guys know that I do discovery calls. Sometimes when, when people come in and they want to buy a coaching package with me, but they want to talk first and see if we're a good fit, I'll do like a 20-minute call with them or their, them and their partner and see if they're the right fit for couples coaching or something like that. Um, if anyone out there is looking for help, please let me know. I'm here to help. You guys know that. You can email me at support at adamlanesmith.com. Anybody who's avoidant out there looking to change your brain chemistry and, and stop yourself from cheating in the future, if you have in the past, or even just learn to bond properly in relationships. I have coaching packages for this. I am here to help. He said he's thinking about a son with you, but I have to lay off of him for the moment. I only want to be friends, but I want to have a son with you, but not right now. But I'm going to give you money to start a business. It, it just sounds like he doesn't know what he wants. It sounds like he's pulling you around by feelings. That's all I mean. Oh, a session with me. Oh, oh. <laughs> I, okay, totally with you. I thought you were telling me he only wants to be friends, but then he wants to get you pregnant. I was going to say that's a very strange definition of friendship. Got you. Okay, you almost got me there. Can being on the spectrum affect your ability to form healthy bonds? It can. Not not because being on the spectrum won't make you bond, but being on the spectrum can just give you a little bit of a neuro, different neurochemistry proper process, uh, different behaviors, different things you might value, different understandings. Uh, what I've under what I've experienced is when I coach people who are on on the spectrum, often they just need to understand the mechanics of how relationships work because they don't understand them intuitively. And they often didn't have anybody sit down and teach them to them. So I just teach them the mechanics of relationships, sometimes in a five-session five dating package, for example. Here are the mechanics of proper dating. And then those guys get girlfriends. Sometimes for the first time in like 30 years, 35 years sometimes. It, it really is just learning the mechanics manually of relationships. I, you know, some of my best clients ever have been on the spectrum because they're so eager to learn the systems. So... It is what it is. What do I do? Be friends? Um, I would just ask, hey, you know what? I, I've noticed that you're saying this, but you seem to be doing this. I really just want clarity so that I can understand because I don't want to cross a line or be weird, but I also don't want us to blunder into something where we don't want to go. So can we just clarify what this is? I'd love to understand you. Seek to understand him. That is my question. That is my thing. Be curious, seek to understand, and have a curious conversation. Seek to understand. Be relational. You said avoidance need to be open to receiving deeper bonds and connections. What helps? What keeps them wanting to stay closed off the patterns that make them miserable? Um, they don't understand that there is any better. Some guy on the internet coming on and saying, you can be open and loving with the right people in your life and share with them and bond with them and they will care about you. And it will mean more than transactionally and, and more than just dopamine. They're like, what is this guy smoking? Because they've never experienced that before. It's like I'm trying to explain the color red to somebody who's never seen it. And they don't believe me that there is a color red. And they really won't until they start to kind of experience it. And they start to see me making a big fuss about how great the color red is. And then other people popping in, social proof. You guys, yeah, the color red, it's incredible. I can't believe the first time I saw it, right? It's not just me just preaching about the color red anymore. It's you guys talking about the color red. And then it turns into... Well, dang, I kind of want to see this. I wonder if this color could be real. And then they want to kind of learn about it and they want to kind of study it. Um, it. It's just that they don't understand and they don't really believe that there's a different piece, Sahara. It, it, believing that there's a different way to live is half of fixing your avoidant attachment. The other half is just the systems to make it work. But belief is half. A little bit off topic. It's 28 tool to have an adventure and discover who you are. You already know who you are. You are a person with specific principles and specific goals. It's just, are you living to who you are? That's really what it is. Are you living to who you are? You don't find yourself out in the world. You define yourself by the decisions you make, the goals you choose to pursue or not, and the principles you choose to uphold or not. That's what defines who we are. We don't have to go find it. It's not out there on a mountaintop or under a pile of sexual partners. It's... It is who are you when you make decisions? That is who you are. 
define yourself that way and then refine yourself into the person you want to be. That's all. That's the process. So no, 28 is not too old for that. I have clients come to me who are 78 and start to begin that process. 28 is definitely ahead of 78, I would say, and it's not too late, too old for It's not too late for 78 year olds to do it. So it's not too late for a 28 year old to do it. It's very doable. All right, you guys, I am out of here for the night. This was wonderful. I do plan to be here again tomorrow as well. As you guys know, I am filming the how to love an avoidant man video course this coming Saturday. That is what I will be doing, and uh, I will let you know as soon as it is ready. My goal is to have it ready by the end of the month so that I can launch it and have it out to all you people who need it, all you avoidantly attached people and the people who love you. We'll get it out there. Hawk, have a good night. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I'm going to talk to all you guys again real soon. In the meantime, be good. <laughs> Watch some videos. Leave some comments. I'm here to read them. I'm here to help. Uh, send me an email at support at adamlanesmith.com. If you need assistance, I am here to help you fix relationships. Let me know how I can help. And I will see you guys again real soon.